Hey guys, Brian here with another video today. Today's going to be a project video and we're going to talk about a coping sled. This is uh, an addition to my shop but also an improvement. I've been making jigs and coping sleds and router table sleds for many years. I usually make them out of plywood or wood, sometimes plastic. But today I'm going to take it a next step further. I'm going to put in a pneumatic cylinder. I'm going to make this out of uh, 6061 T6 aluminum, all very thick, beefy parts as well as steel. So stick around and I'll show you what's going on. Okay, so why don't I start off by showing you what I've got existing and what I'm trying to improve on. This is about as bare bones and simple as it can get. You don't have to go out and buy these from sites on the internet from woodworking outlets. You can just make these from bare bone parts in your shop. Toggle clamps is usually something you probably have around the shop. They're really dirt cheap if you don't. Um, these are just scrap, this is just scrap MDF and plywood. You can make this out of Baltic birch or some other synthetic material. Uh, it's up to you. Um, the crucial part on the bottom is this miter slot bar that goes right in there, precision. Um, and obviously the important factor is the fact that this is parallel to the edge of the material that you're working on and also that this jig is perpendicular to the fence on your shape or your router table. The basic components of this jig are the base, the bottom bar which I showed you which is actually through tapped through this MDF to the bottom of this aluminum. The fence on here with the three toggle clamps, I put two, I hardly ever use the two, I basically just use one. And then you also have the smaller one, which is to clamp down your backer so you don't get tear out. So what I basically want to do is replace these toggle clamps with a pneumatic cylinder so that I'm not sitting here and reefing down on these. Doing one or two parts, it really doesn't matter. But if you're going to make uh, production style parts and you're going to make hundreds of parts, there's nothing better than a simple pneumatic air valve to do basically what you're doing with the toggle switch. And it's just no effort and there's no strain. These put a lot of strain on your hands over a period of time and I just don't like them. They're very uncomfortable. Uh, it, as far as the backer, I think I'm just going to screw it into the side of the fence that I'm going to put on this out of aluminum. That's what I did with the Ritter one when I used one before in a production shop. Um, there's no sense in putting a separate cylinder and it would have to be a pretty small cylinder because these strips I make them pretty small anyways. Um, that might change over time and I might add a separate cylinder. We'll just see kind of how it plays out. I want to keep it simple and expand on it. So I'll kind of show you all the parts that I've got going on here. I'll go through it step by step before I start drilling and milling these. Um, I should preface by saying that I'm actually not a metal worker. I am a woodworker full time. That is my profession. Uh, but I do dabble with metal work. So if you're looking for really precision results, um, this is certainly not the channel uh, for that. Uh, there are other channels out there like Grimsmo Knives or even like Clickspring. If you really want to see some elite quality milling, I would suggest you check out those channels. Uh, with that said, I'm trying to show you guys how to build this with minimal tools in your shop and experience as a woodworker from a woodworking point of view. Um, because the truth is you could really just build this out of plywood and while it would have a lot of flex, it would still work and it would do the same job. I'm just trying to build a jig that's going to last for the next 30 years and be very precise and repeatable. Uh, and just be a whole lot more beefier than I have right now because there's no sense in upgrading my jig into wood and making it like this. I should just leave it the way it is. Um, so I'm going kind of full blown on this and um, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to do it, you should do it 100%, do it right, or at least do it to the best of your resources and abilities. Okay, so let me show you this. I got their jig here. The base plate is 5.8 6061 T6 aluminum, which is really nice uh, for milling and machining. Um, the base plate is 12 by 12. You can size this up or size it down depending on your needs. The fence, this is 5 8 uh, again, all 6061 T6 aluminum. I had all these parts saw cut for me, uh, with the exception of these guys, which I had to cut down because I wasn't sure on the height exactly how I wanted it. Um, but I will update the BOM to reflect that you can purchase just about all these parts pre-cut for you. You might have to face them off on the end because you have some kind of rough saw cuts on them. I haven't sanded these yet. You can kind of see there's some saw cuts that are rough, but, but I'll certainly display the vendor in the description where you could just buy all these from uh, as one order and you don't have to cut any of this. You don't even need to buy any aluminum bandsaw or, or saw blades. You can just do this yourself with a sander and just a drill press. So you got your base plate, you've got your two sides, which is like your fence for this side, and, and this is just another side for supporting the bars on top. And then you're going to have two steel bars on top, which would be more or less right here. You're going to have a plate here. Oops, switch this around. You're going to have another bar under here, which is just going to be a spacer. 
for this lock bar. And this guy is going to sit underneath these two bars. The air cylinder is going to sit in here like this. I'm going to actually tap this aluminum plate and it's going to go through here. It's going to sit flush pretty much like this on this nice uh, precision machine ground surface. So it'll sit nice and perpendicular. Uh, and what this slot channel allows you to do is slide it back and forth. This is based on the Ritter design that they actually make this sled this way. I kind of just copied them because um, it's a very simple design. You can just see from a picture. So that's pretty much it. Uh, and now I've also got some other miscellaneous parts. Um, the air cylinders are very easy to work with. I suggest if you don't have these available locally to check online because they're so much easier to work with. You can buy this regular quarter inch hose and it has these quick connects and you just push it in. There's no fittings, there's no fussing with hose lines. Don't make these out of copper or anything like that or, or these flex tubing where you gotta make a, a ferrule on the end of it. It's such a waste of time. These guys are so robust and these are what basically are used throughout industry and in automation. Um, you just push them in and they connect and if you want to take them out you push this release down and you pull it out. It's just got these jaws on it. Very robust and easy to use. Um, on the end of this I'm going to put a swivel connector. Now obviously in line here I'll have a switch and that's what this guy is and this is my solenoid or pneumatic valve uh, switch here and this will open and close. It has a supply and uh, an output for the actual cylinder. And just to kind of show you real quick how this cylinder works. Just so you know, this is a, a single acting spring return, meaning that uh, I will apply air to the cylinder, it'll push it out, and after I let the air out, it'll return back. On the double acting ones, it'll have two ports on them where you can actually uh, supply air to both move it down and back. Uh, so you can control it a lot easier, and it's not just a spring return, you can actually regulate how fast it goes back and, and all that jazz. But anyways, for the simplicity's sake, I just wanted a spring return for this air cylinder. And I'll just put it on the air hose, I don't even know if I have any money. Yeah, I do have a little bit. So you can see here, this is just leaking because I haven't tightened these fittings down yet. And that's pretty much it. This has a two inch stroke or, or the length of the travel of the rod itself. And that allows me to use a lot of different materials. And you're not restricted to that two inches. The two inches gives you a lot of room. It'll hit whatever the top of the material is with the applied pressure through the cylinder. So if it's inch and a half stock, it'll hit it. If it's inch stock, just have to be careful with your maximum and your minimum for uh, design for this. Uh, for most people, if you build it this way, it'll work out just fine. I built it with a minimum of a little bit under three quarter inch stock and a maximum probably around inch and a half. And that pretty much covers all your doors and panels um, and all the other miscellaneous profiling stock it's what people usually work with. Okay, and so before I get started with the milling, I'm just gonna show you what my strategy is for the fastening. Uh, basically, the sides are gonna get tapped the bottom plate is going to get a clearance hole and a countersink and I'm going to come in from the bottom with a fastener into the side walls of these. I think I'm going to use M6 by 30 millimeter fasteners. It seems like a good fit for this. And the top bars here are going to get the same. They're going to get I think 6 by 30. I, I believe I'll do socket head cap screws. All the stuff will be in the bill of materials. But these will get tapped into the side of this and these will just get clearance holes. The top plate for the cylinder will get tapped. I've got a couple clearance holes. I've laid out all this stuff now to kind of save time and not show you. It's pretty simple. If you're not familiar, I'd suggest you buy some Daikin layout fluid. It's very easy to lay out. You basically apply the fluid, let it dry, and then with your T-square, you lay out stuff. You don't need really precision start stuff or, or uh, precision calipers. Um, the purpose of this is not that. And this is actually brings up a good point. Uh, this is not going to be a precision machine piece of equipment, although it's going to be very precise. Um, it's not going to be to the likes of some machinist. But really there's only two important parts of this jig. One is that this thing is coplanar with the machine surface so that they mate uh, very nicely, they're not off plane. And also that this fence is perpendicular to the fence on your machine. And, and that's pretty much the most important part there. These two will decide whether or not your door parts will mate up very well. Um, otherwise, sometimes they'll be twisted where you'll be coping on a slight angle um, or your parts won't be square and they won't be a nice uh, 90 degree end, which won't make for nice square panels. So Now, I thought about that ahead of time and you're never going to get that perfect unless you've got a CNC machine. And even then, sometimes you need some margin of error. And to allow for that, I'm going to put some clearance holes in that slot uh, in the bottom and that'll allow me to play with that miter bar slot and, and just tweak it. And I just tweak it right on the machine because every machine's a little bit different. Not all the miter bar slots are lined up parallel with the machine anyways. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. 
The only other thing I'll probably do after I put the miter bar on the bottom, like this one, is I'll put a really low friction tape on the bottom. I might even get some uh, HDPE or something else, uh, thin strips to put on the bottom. I'm not sure. This stuff works really well and it's cheap and effective. And we'll just see how that goes. On the Ritter and some of the higher end machines, you'll find that they put bearing slides on here. That's another step you can take. I'm just not going to do that because it adds more to the cost. Uh, and it's just really not necessary for this application. So that's that. That's enough of the talking. Let's just let's get drilled. Okay, so last one for this guy is I gotta tap these M4 holes and they're blind, so I'm gonna use a blind tap. This is a spiral tap, so it works really nice if you have one of these automatic tapping heads, which I do have. I'm just not gonna bust it out for the purpose of this video because most of you don't. Like I said, I'm not a machinist, but I'll try to show you how best I do these. If you chamfer these holes out, it really gives you a nice place to set it. It won't go in on, on a really crooked angle or anything. And the most important thing is just to keep it as best 90 degrees as you can. There's all sorts of tricks with this. Um, you can make little blocks that keeps the thing perpendicular to the surface that you're uh, tapping. And I like to make a couple turns, back it up, and take it out. And actually, I forgot to do one thing which I want to do right now. This stuff is like the magic sauce of tapping holes. And it's called Tap Magic Cutting Fluid. And specifically for aluminum. This, At least this one, I don't know if they make any other ones. Okay, so now that these two parts are done, I'm going to work on the steel bars on the top, as well as the sides after, and the bottom plate, and then drill the bottom plate with the, the bottom miter slot bar, clean everything up, sand it, and we're ready for final assembly. So I've just dry fit everything and mocked it up and I'll show you the final assembly in that process uh, when I'm all said and done and I use the correct fasteners and everything. The last component uh, that I have to configure on this uh, aluminum piece is this switch. I just wanted to see where this would fit best on the sled, maybe even put it on the shaper, see what works best. I wasn't sure. It's sometimes hard to know how you want to lay things out until you actually get it built. And I've also got to make a shoe for the bottom of the cylinder and put a rubber pad on it. Last time I had a friend turn one for me uh, in a machine shop. He was making a bunch for another friend and I asked him to make me some. It's an odd thread size which I didn't have the tap. This time around I bought taps. Um, I bought a gun tap and the other tap to, to go through. I think I'll probably through tap it like this machinist did. And uh, again, I purchased pre-made parts. You can get these in different lengths. These are just uh, inch and a half discs 
and they cut them. They're saw cut, they're from McMaster Car. So here are my two different thicknesses. They're drilled and tapped. I chamfered and probably cleaned them up a little bit after. I've got to make little rubber feet for them. This will provide a little bit of friction underneath the pads and then make these non-marring, hopefully. Uh, I couldn't decide what rubber to use. I've done this with other cylinders. If there's something out there that somebody knows about where you can buy these pads ready, uh, please let me know. Uh, you can spend quite a bit trying to figure out what durometer and everything you want. I find it easier sometimes just to find something around the house and, and use that. Um, old mouse pad it's like the perfect durometer of what I need for this application it's nice and thin and it's free so we're going to use this guy I'm going to use a professional grade contact cement uh, apply these and, and it, this holds on to aluminum pretty well <laughs> tubing it's really inexpensive for the long piece of length that they sell them in buy a whole bunch because you might not do it the way you want it initially and you might want to reconfigure it or you just might end up doing a couple of these projects and if you have to buy the tubing separately it's expensive um, for shipping reasons uh, so first guy I've got all these set up all these I put a ball valve on the supply end I need to find a way to mount this at some point so it's not just hanging off but I'll just leave it as is for now I might just uh, you know feed it from the top or something like that but I've got to find a way to mount this and I'll probably end up just making a simple aluminum bracket to go here and just stick the valve valve like that I'm going to start playing with the tubing and kind of sort of figure out what works best you obviously want to leave a little bit of a coil from here to the cylinder because as you move this guy around his length is going to change you can buy coils for this uh, I'm going to do it pretty simple and uh, just make my own little coil yeah well misfired here again folks we gotta make a mount for this guy and yeah I just don't have the right size for these 90 degree and some of these should be straight so I'm trying to work with what I got and not stop this project for another weekend while I wait for parts so less than ideal but I'll perfect this in the design when I put out the bill ma'am for this and you guys get all the right parts for doing this straight up so uh, I've got to mount this hose I want this to go underneath the shaper so this clears the end of the table and the hose will go underneath the table and none of that fuss and above table. To mount this, and I just basically used the cylinder mount that came with the cylinder, uh, came up a little jerry rigging, had to put an extra washer in there, had to find a flat wrench to fit in there. Anyways, I got this guy set up all nice and good. I just need to lay out holes for these, uh, for this mounting bracket. And they're slotted, so this should be pretty straightforward. Okay, so now we can mount this guy on. Put some quarter 20 fasteners. Again, not totally ideal, but it'll get the job done in a timely manner. Yeah, that guy's not going anywhere. Two quarter 20 fasteners drilled and tapped. There's no flex in it. So now I can take this guy, cut him to length, and cut him to length. I reckon he's going to be about there. Cut a little bit longer, 
get a nice fit. This is not ideal to go on a nice curve like this, but it still works just fine. And that's it. Now we're ready for our air supply and see how this guy works. Okay, time for final assembly. I've got the two sides mounted with these M6 fasteners. I think 30 millimeter. Everything will be on the bill of materials, so don't worry about fastener size. And I'm putting together plans for this later on. Uh, and any changes that I've made, any mistakes that I've made, uh, I'm going to make corrections later for more ideal fasteners. Um, I'm just trying to use stuff that I have in the shop rather than keep running out or keep ordering stuff um, just to get it done because I really need to use this uh, jig and it's just not an ideal world. So let's just get started. Quick little time lapse of the rebuild of this guy. So now I got these guys on, what I need to do is find just the right enough clearance to get these bars spread that this guy moves around nice and free. And what I'll do is just basically start on one side, leave that nice and loose, and then go right to the other. You can see I tighten these guys down a little bit too much. There we go. Again, this is not overly crucial, but you definitely might want to consider doing socket head fasteners because if you get these off even a little bit with the flat head fasteners, they'll really pull them into wherever you drill the holes. And if they're off, they're going to be off, and there's no way you can really fix the hole easier, as far as I know. One little trick though, by the way, if you get these off a little bit, you can always flip these around. So if they're too tight uh, and you put the holes too close to the edge here, you can flip it around and get the inverse and then you just have clearance on the other side. That's a really nice positive lock there and a nice little linear system. And what I can do is expand on this and make another cylinder. So if I'm doing like a small raised panel or a larger rail, like if you're doing wall paneling, um, this is really nice because now I can make this modular, just buy a couple parts and make a second one. And that's probably what I'm going to end up doing is have two cylinders. So now I'm going to insert the miter slot bar. And I've just used this piece from the other jig I had because that's going to be kind of garbage. And I'm going to plan on using this jig just for both machines now. The pneumatics make things so much easier. It's really hard to go from an MDF jig to something like this and keep using the other one. Again, with this one, the alignment is critical. You really want this bar lined up perpendicular to the fence or the, the shaper spindle that you have on the table. So. I will probably adjust and make some design modifications when I go to do the drawings for this and doing counter bore. I'll probably use still same M6 fasteners, pretty good size, but to make these counter bore from the other side rather than counter sink because it gives you a lot more uh, room for adjustment. With the counter sink, you really have like a hair at best, and it's not great if you're not going to get it right on. strip of that tape on either side and a um, little wax on the table will do. It's pretty smooth. I might come up with something better in the future, but for now this works really well and having the extra mass of this aluminum really keeps it stable. Time to work up the pneumatics, get these piped in and give it a go.
after configuring this, now that everything's all installed and it's working nice, is to set up this T-slot. And really the most important thing is that this guy is parallel to this edge. I know that this part is now perpendicular because I faced this, and I need to make sure that the offset here is the same from here, from these edges. Again, nothing too crazy. This is not a machinist quality jig. So I can see that's right about 63 mil. And I'm just going to tighten that one down and see if I can get the other one to 63 mil. Again, I'm going to come down here and I really want to get as close to 63. You want to keep the other fasteners out. I mean, you want to keep them in, uh, rather, but not tighten down because they'll throw you off. And then once you get the two outbound fasteners worked out front and back, you can tighten up the middle ones because those are really just for strength, not for alignment. So I'm happy with that. I'm just going to undo my caliper here. Go back to zero, zero it out and just check it again. Again, this is not super precise, but it's just going to get me pretty close. Again, I'm coping wood, which has a tolerance in itself. It's not like we're machining metal. Alright, so I got 62.88. And we're going to come down here. And I got 62.9 millimeters, so that's point tenth of a millimeter really close that's close enough and now what I'll do is lock down these two middle screws and then just double check it one more time and make sure nothing's moved again I can't stress enough if this is really a great time to use a counter bore with a cap screw and just have more play because you really don't want to fight this if I just got lucky and got this pretty darn close and I was also really careful when I did the layout but um, if you don't, you're going to be fighting this and you're never going to get it really true without any clearance. So it just don't go crazy on this. Just give yourself clearance. Nothing has to be military fit. And look at that. It's right on. I'll go right in the middle. And I got no flex. It's right on. So now this edge is completely parallel to the front edge of the jig and, and we're pretty much good to go. The ultimate test is just getting a wide board coping it or making any profile that I clear the edge off a little bit and just checking the piece for square. And if it's relatively square, life is good. There's nothing that I'm going to stress out. I'm not going to put a dial indicator on this because like I said, I'm machining wood and wood kind of grows and expands according to nature. So this is not a machinist quality, but it's going to be a heck of a lot better than what I had. And it's certainly a lot better than just some plywood jig that's going to move anyways. Now I don't want to put a square on the fence here because this fence is not parallel. I have this probably on the taper. It really doesn't matter. This is just a reference offset so that I know that I'm taking off a 30 second each time. The jig's going to hold it in place with respect to the slot. So I, I don't really stress it out about the fence. Um, again, th this fence could be on a taper either way. It doesn't really matter. The only important thing is that this guy, this air pneumatic cylinder is holding the part down with respect to the jig, with respect to the slot, and life is good. So. Time to cope apart and see how we work out. All right, so I got this backer in here, and this backer's not long enough. I'm just gonna have to get accustomed to making longer backers because this jig is larger than the other one. So I'm just gonna put one fastener in, and this is really just a test anyways. Okay, so I've just cut a piece of uh, poplar stock up here. That's already been profiled on the front edge, and now I'm just gonna cope this profile on the edge profile on the edge. And you can see that this guy's just pretty much dead square. My miter saw is set up good. And now I just need to set the height of the shaper now that I've changed this. The nice part of this rail feature is I can just slide this guy down here and actually put it wherever I want it. Okay so now I've got the spindle height adjusted to this new jig and I've got a piece we're gonna stick in here. Like I said this piece is already square. I suspect it, but I always remove a 30 second uh, in addition to making the profile. It makes for a nice clean cut, and especially if your saw isn't square, you can use your shaper to square up the cut. So now look how easy it is to clamp stuff down. Just effortless.
can see. I mean, that's just about as square as you could hope for on a first shot. And obviously this is only two inches of width. If you had like 10 inches, it's gonna make a huge difference. Um, your taper angle will start to change very drastically. But considering all the stock that we cope is no bigger than about three inches at the moment, this works out great. Nice clean cut, much less chatter than there was before because I was using the MDF jig and there is some uh, chatter involved because I've got a lot more mass, it's dampening the vibrations a little bit better, it's holding the workpiece a lot stronger. It's also safer, it gives me a much better grip. I'm gripping up here rather than much closer to the toggle clamps and the jig. So this jig is working better um, and it's also safer, which is also a huge plus in any case. So let's recap on this project. So that's it. It's not an overly complex jig, but it's probably something maybe a little bit more than you're used to if you're not used to working with metal. It's a great medium for making jigs, uh, just like a hard plastics are. It just provides a lot more mass for your jig for the table. It'll work a little bit better. There's nothing wrong with using an MDF for a Baltic birch plywood jig. It actually will produce pretty much the same results. There's a couple added benefits. This is certainly a lot easier. It's less fatiguing. It's safer. It'll work a little bit better and give you better cut quality because it's firmer on the table. But overall, it's a really effective way to spend maybe about $150 to produce like a $1,000 jig. I've tried to choose components and design this in a way that it kind of matches the existing products that, it, that are out there that are very expensive, by the way, but that require minimal tools. And that's aid to the fact that a lot of these parts can be purchased, saw cut. All you need to do is dress them up and basically drill and tap some holes, some clearance holes, some countersinks or counter bores, and basically assembly. And I will be putting together a comprehensive bill of materials and drawing set to go along with this. So please take a look out in the comment description and the comments below. In the coming days and weeks I'll put out a drawing set. I'm not sure if I'll charge for it. Depends how much time I have to put into it. If it's only a short amount of time, I'll certainly probably just put it out for free. If you did like this, please comment, rate, and subscribe. It really helps to get feedback from you guys so I can make improvements in the future videos. I'm not a video firm, I'm a, I'm a woodworker professionally, and uh, this isn't what I'm necessarily really good at. So if you have any offers of uh, suggestions or improvements, please let me know so I can make improvements in continuing videos. Keep a lookout. I will be putting out a major tool, floor setting tool, this week review, as well as a three cool tools episode number two. So take a look at my channel. If you're not a subscriber, it would be a great time to subscribe. And as always, if you have any feedback or questions, feel free to ask. I'm here to help. See you guys next time. Take care.